Hi. We're told that we're live, so I'm going to say hi to people that are out there, though it says no viewers as of yet, but I suspect some will be coming on soon. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, so I am Jen Rackman, uh, Circle Surrogacy. I'm very fortunate that Stupid Cancer is hosting this webinar tonight to give us the opportunity to talk about surrogacy for survivors. Um, I'm going to cover varying topics about family building options for survivors after people are diagnosed with cancer. So, um, for those who are signing on, you can ask questions if you'd like. You can type them into the Q&A. There's a little tab to the left of your screen, and you can type questions that we'll get to at the end of our presentation. Um, so, welcome. Glad that you're able to join us. And I guess we'll get started. So we have a little slideshow for you. Okay, excellent. Great. So I think it's important to start by talking about just how many young adult survivors are diagnosed each year. Um, who face a unique set of issues that not necessarily are as important to say older or necessarily younger survivors, um, whether it's employment concerns or sex and intimacy, uh, managing your fears or what we're talking about today, concerns about fertility and family building options. Um, these are really unique to this specific group that we're speaking to. So I'm going to start by just giving you some information about who I am um, and why I'm here and how I get to tell, share this information that's so important. So I'm a 10-year ovarian cancer survivor. Um, at 26, life was pretty uh, uneventful and wonderful at the same time. I was just moved in with my boyfriend, and we had um, building our careers and enjoying life and a routine trip to the gynecologist lends itself to a there's something doesn't feel right and I think you should go for further testing and that resulted in a diagnosis of ovarian cancer which lended itself to a hysterectomy um, removal of my ovaries and not being able to do any fertility preservation methods because the cancer is in both of my ovaries so I was not able to preserve my eggs um, <coughs> Life went on, thank God. I did my treatment and came out the other end, and I'm still here 10 years later. And fast forward many years, my then boyfriend, now husband, and I decided to finally feel comfortable exploring family building options and what they were for us. So um, we started to kind of go back and forth between, we talked a little bit about adoption um, versus surrogacy and spend some time exploring to figure out since those are the two options that we had um, to use an egg donor and use a surrogate and or adopt and we decided that the route for us was to do egg donation and surrogacy um, then fast forward a little bit of time and my son was born in 2012 and um, the process was truly a remarkable experience to go through though it was not I don't mean to make it sound so glorified. It was not how I expected to have a child. It was not the way one intends to become a mom. Um, however, when you know life throws you a curveball, then you are, you know, first to that, forced to kind of go off track and see what options are for you. So um, my son was born in 2012. We used circle surrogacy to have our son, and shortly after he was born, I. Um, had some talks with Circle about doing work in the cancer community because for me as a survivor, I found it hard to find this information. Um, my oncologist didn't know a lot about it and <coughs> reproductive endocrinologist didn't really know where to point me. So uh, I found that there was a gap of information out there. So I spoke with the uh, my boss at Circle Service who felt that this was an important group to give us information to. Um, so here I am now, about two years, doing more and more work you know, in the cancer 
in the cancer world to give us information to survivors because I found it hard to locate it. So that's how I got to be sitting here in front of you today, um, hoping that I'm giving you information that um, whether you need it or not is still empowering to have and to know what your options are. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the upside in the world of fertility um, when it comes to cancer survivors. So there has been an inc a dramatic increase in the amount of awareness and education that's being provided to survivors about their fertility preservation, um, what options are available for them. And each year, you know, medical professionals are taking more and more steps to, to educate before starting treatment, um, which is really a, an amazing step so that survivors know that there are options out there. And um, the association, the American Society for Clinical Oncology created guidelines that survivors are entitled to education about how their cancer treatment will affect their reproductive health. And this is tremendous in that this did not exist years ago. It certainly didn't exist when I uh, was diagnosed 10 years ago. So I'm glad to know that there are improvements in that. Um, hi, some other people joining us. Come on, have a seat. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, on the downside, even though survivors are being educated more about their options, not as many as you would hope or think are actually going through the preservation, which is a uh, concerning and upsetting, and we're trying to figure out why that is, but um, surveys have been done by the Livestrong Foundation that said 76% of survivors surveyed between 15 and 39 mm -hmm. did not preserve their fertility before treated, um, even though they were educated about it. So that's, you know, three quarters of survivors that were not taking that step. Um, I do believe every year we're seeing more and more survivors doing it, but it's a slow growing, and we don't know why people are not taking the time to preserve their fertility and give themselves more options down the road. So I want to take a moment and acknowledge that um, when you are a cancer survivor and you're dealing with cancer and all that comes with it, all the good stuff there, um, the to learn that you're possibly infertile, to learn that you, um, you know, is a whole nother whole other thing to deal with. So it's important to talk to your doctor about your, what your options are, um, preferably a reproductive endocrinologist, but even more so an oncofertility specialist. I'm using that term oncofertility for the first time because it's a newer field um, where oncologists and reproductive endocrinologists are joining forces to educate and treat and um, so they are aware of the needs of cancer survivors, but also um, being able to give them their op more options about either preserving or what their options are after treatment. Um, so if you've met with a doctor, if you're at the point where you have already met with a doctor and you know that you are likely infertile, then what? Um, I think it's important to take a moment and acknowledge that dealing with all the loss that comes with a cancer diagnosis is one thing, but also then to deal with the emotions that come with a loss of fertility after the fact is another, uh, a whole other animal. And I think that it's important for us as survivors to take a moment and sit with that and come to terms with whatever, you know, if there's a loss there, what that feels like um, before you start exploring. Um, and when you feel emotionally ready to explore, if you know that you have lost your fertility, it's important to know that there are options. I know for me, I spent probably two or three years in a bit of a cloud of I'm going to just ignore babies. I'm going to ignore that pregnancy and babies exist. I just kind of went to a place where I didn't, um, I just ignored it. Um, but you can only ignore it for so long when you know in the back of your mind that you want to become a parent and people around you have babies, people around you are getting pregnant and you know it's something that for me was in my face and I was unable to avoid it any longer. Um, I distinctly remember when my very best friend told me she was pregnant and what that felt like and that kind of pushed me to a place of I need to stop ignoring this because I'm upset about it and I need to face that those feelings. Um, so. I did start to explore and research and read, and mainly online, because it was hard to get the information elsewhere, about egg donation and surrogacy. Um, and 
educate myself. And there was a certain empowerment with that. There was a certain feeling that you can, um, that there was still a way to become a parent even after cancer had taken my fertility. So it was empowering to know that there were options out there. And then I started to feel more comfortable reading and learning and talking about it than I had before. Um, so a couple of options I'm gonna talk about are the use of an egg donor, the use of a gestational carrier or surrogate, whatever term you feel comfortable using, um, and adoption I'm gonna speak briefly on as well. So what is egg donation? So for survivors whose cancer either affected the function of their ovaries or you know, weren't able to go through preservation methods and treatment might have left them um, not functional after the fact, um, can use an egg donor. An egg donor is a woman who can donate through IVF clinics, egg donor agencies, or privately. They're typically compensated between $8,000 and $10,000. Eight thousand for our first time donation, ten thousand if they're uh, what we call a proven donor, and they have donated, and we know that they we've had success with their donation. Um, and after looking at profiles, and you pick one you like, the donor will donate their eggs and combine them with sperm to create embryos. And the fertilized embryos will grow in a lab at a fertility clinic, and then can be transferred into your uterus or a gestational carrier's uterus and carried to term. So for those who whose uterus is intact and Whoa. hormones are not of concern and can carry, um, but had some damage to their ovaries or weren't able to preserve their eggs, that use, use of an egg donor is an option. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, what are the qualifications to be an egg donor? What, is, what does that person look like? Who is this woman? So here I have a list of some of the qualifications to become an egg donor. Egg donors are in their 20s, between 20 and 29. Um, they can go up to 31 if they donate before we know that the edge quality was good. Um, that's not totally typical. Um, they have to have a body mass index lower than 28. And um, they cannot have more than one occurrence of the same type of cancer in their family histories. Um, they, for example, they can't have multiple breast cancer survivors. Or um, So I know for me, when I was choosing my egg donor, this was something that was very important to me. Um, on my husband's side, there's already cancer there, so there was already that component. But I was trying to you know, find someone that had no, it does exist. There are people out there that do not have cancer in their family, and it does happen. Though not so common, <laughs> but it does happen. Um, no heart disease in their family, no history of psychiatric hospitalization, they must be a US citizen. Um, they must have at least a high school degree, um, though college is preferred. A lot of egg donors are, are our students, are in type, whether it's going for some sort of certification or college or graduate school. Um, we encourage all ethnic backgrounds to apply, though I will say that some are more predominant donors culturally than others. Um, and they must be comfortable, they're educated on what it entails to be an egg donor, which really, you know, they're giving themselves injectables, um, injectable hormones to get their bodies prepared to overstimulate their ovaries and, and remove the ovaries, the uh, eggs that are, the eggs that are created. So, um, and they also have to be very open with their health history and disclosing what their family health history is. So that's a list of criteria for an egg donor. What is surrogacy? So surrogacy is when you need the use of a gestational carrier, a woman who is going to carry your baby to term. Um, surrogacy allows survivors who are unable to carry a pregnancy to still become parents. And gestational surrogates, they carry the embryos that were created through in vitro fertilization and deliver the child on behalf of what we call the intended parents. So for people that are coming into our program, um, we call them short, we say IPs, um, our intended parents that are needing a surrogate to have a family. Um, surrogates can be located through surrogacy agencies like Circle Surrogacy, lawyers, um, or hired independently, though I'm not one to recommend the idea of hiring someone independently. Um, there's a lot of rigorous screening that surrogates go through to make sure that they are appropriate to be a surrogate. Um, so to hire independently, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of things to put together, a lot of ducks to put in a row, and it can be very challenging. Um, and surrogacy laws vary from state to state. 
county to county, they're constantly changing. It's very important to have the guidance of a professional on the field, um, who, a surrogacy family lawyer who's very aware of all the little nuances of surrogacy law. Um, surrogacy law is dictated by where the surrogate gives birth. It has nothing to do with where our intended parents live. For us, we're all here broadcasting from New York, and for those who are in this area, um, you know, we know New York is one of five states, we're going to talk about that, who, which are not surrogacy-friendly states. Um, so to give you some information about what are the qualifications to be a surrogate, so surrogate and egg donor have different sets of criteria. Surrogates can be a bit older. Women can carry pregnancies far later than they can, um, far longer than their eggs will survive. <coughs> Um, they're typically between ages 21 to 41, though most of our surrogates are in the middle of that range. They're more so 24 to say 34. Um, they have to live in a surrogate-friendly state, and that's what I was just saying earlier, that um, we do not accept carriers who reside in Washington, D.C., Washington State, Nebraska, Louisiana, Michigan, New York, or New Jersey, or anywhere outside the U.S. for that matter. We only do domestic surrogacy. Um, but all the other states are um, are able to be used. They just have varying laws that depend on the legal work that needs to be done state to state. They have to have had the one major criteria, aside from the legal aspect, is that they have to have had a successful, healthy pregnancy. A woman can come forward and say, I really want to be a carrier, but if you medically can't prove that your body's capable of it, we wouldn't take a risk. Um, so she has to be, say, she has to be able to medically document that she has had a healthy birth. Even if she has had a miscarriage, she has to have had a healthy birth since then. Um, so they cannot, um, they have to have a body mass index no higher than 32, and they cannot participate in certain government aid programming, including such aid housing. Um, they have to have a supportive family and friends. You know, one of the things that we do is we assess not only the surrogate, not only spending time with her and talking to her about why she wants to be a surrogate and um, what she hopes to, how she hopes to connect with our intended parents and how she, um, we want to make sure that she is psychologically healthy and, and the way she's viewing this process. But also, we assess her her support system um, because she's not going through this alone. So we take the time and we talk to whether it's a spouse or a family member or a partner and, and interview them and assess them as well to make sure that they truly are um, on board and that they're supportive of this process. Obviously, no um, drinking, smoking, illegal drugs are not able to be used. Um, and they generally have medical insurance, but this is not a requirement. Um, insurance is a whole separate piece of, of surrogacy. Um, there are some surrogates insurance that are able to cover the cost of the pregnancy, and some that aren't. Um, so that's part of the benefit of using an agency that can kind of look at her insurance coverage and assess and make sure that it's something that we can use or not use. And if it can't be used, then we would help you try to buy an insurance policy for her to cover the pregnancy. And women who have had um, IUDs um, must be willing to have their IUDs removed before the transfer um, so that they can um, go through the IVF process appropriately and not have any damage. So those are the qualifications for one to be a surrogate. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I'm not someone that works in the field of adoption, but I think it's important to acknowledge I have, I've had a lot of survivors that have asked me questions about, um, you know, why go through all the trouble of surrogacy when there are so many children out there that need wonderful homes and can adopt. And um, So I think it's important to acknowledge that adoption is an option that's a wonderful option for survivors, um, and that both domestic and international adoption are a viable option for cancer survivors. Um, though they may, there may be unique challenges in the process. For example, certain agencies have stricter criteria for cancer survivors. Um, survivors are often fearful that they'll be rejected based on their cancer history, but this is not true. There are many sort of agencies out there that are what we call cancer-friendly adoption agencies and are very capable of supporting survivors and becoming parents in this way. Um, so I think that's an important thing to acknowledge. I also want to mention some wonderful resources out there for survivors who are trying to explore their different options. Um, so there's a couple listed there. My Uncle Fertility, Fertility Action, Fertile Hope, and Save My Fertility are all websites that have listings of 
cancer-friendly adoption agencies as well as surrogacy and egg donation. Um, they all have information about family building options. So my, I told you my story, and I want to share a little bit about what my role is um, you know, to educate and collaborate with those in the cancer community so that survivors have the information to become parents after a cancer diagnosis if they choose to. And I, I'd like to consider myself a resource for survivors and providers who are seeking information about these processes. Um, for those who are listening live, can answer questions now, can ask questions now, but for those who are listening at a later date and want to email me, my information will be provided at the end of this presentation so you have it. I'm always open for people contacting me at a later time. Um, and like I said before, Circle Surrogacy has allowed me to be part of the staff, to be their voice in the cancer community. And we're working to educate more survivors each year about ways to become parents after cancer. A little bit about, a little shameless plug here about Circle, uh, so you know what sets us apart from other agencies. Um, we were founded in 1995. We're one of the oldest and largest surrogacy and egg donation agencies in the world. Um, we've had over 800 births, so I believe we're approaching our 900 soon. Um, Circle's a full service agency, which means we have all the professionals that you need for this process under one roof. Um, some other agencies, when you look, might be smaller in size and have to contract out to various parts of their staff. Um, we're all under one roof, which makes for a really easy communication and process. And the agency, we, we provide a free two-hour consultation, either in person or through Skype, um, for those who are really considering surrogacy as an option and want more information. And um, we do offer a discount off the agency fee when you're provided when you're referred to medical professionals. Um, we also have a financing program, which I'm going to give a little more information about, which is huge because I know when I was a client a couple of years ago, um, it didn't exist. So they have a we work with American Healthcare Lending for people that want to pay things off over time. Hi, I'm come Leslie. on in, come on Sorry. in, Leslie. That's okay. Super late. No, it's okay. Thanks for joining us. So we do have a financing option, which I know is free. I know a lot of, I know I feel incredibly guilty when survivors start talking to me about costs. Here we are as survivors and we've had medical bills and we've had this inconvenience of having to pay for things that other people can just, you know, just go get pregnant and, you know, it's just easy. Um, they don't have to worry about paying for it. And I know that um, for me it was frustrating and it was a challenge to come up with the money and figure out how to pay it, how to pay for it, especially up front. Having the ability to do a financing program is great because you can pay it over time. Um, it's a seven-year program. The interest rates are really low. It's based on your credit score. It's um, it's a really wonderful option to you know, that you can pay things up over time. Um, and uh, we have a social work staff that's wonderful um, and capable of providing support and guidance throughout the process because you know surrogacy, like any other pregnancy process. Um, has its ups and downs and its bumps in the road, and it's important to have supports in place. So if you decide you wanted to become a parent through surrogacy, what are the next steps? What happens? So what we encourage is to request a consultation and have get some more information. And our consultations are free, they're two to three hours, free information. Um, during your consultation, you'll be asked to share some personal information about your cancer history and what your family building goals are. And our role is really to educate you about the process, as well as help you assess your current status and your support system to make sure that you're ready physically and emotionally to go through a surrogacy journey. Um, and after your consult, if you decide you would like to start a surrogacy journey, you'll be asked to provide some information about your current health status and treatment plans moving forward, including a letter from your oncologist, um, as well as asked in the future if there were any changes to your health status to let us know and include us in that conversation. Um, so, you know, I think that we at Circle love the idea of helping survivors become parents. Um, but I think it's also important to acknowledge what we've been through as survivors and how we got to this point and be comfortable talking about it um, and allow us to support you and help you figure out if this is the right next step for you. And that's part of our initial assessment when we sit down and have a conversation. Um, what are some options in terms of programs that are offered? We have um, IVF clinics that we work with that offer an unlimited IVF Plan, which is pretty amazing because you can pay a certain amount and have a fixed rate and then it allows you as many attempts as you need to get pregnant which is pretty wonderful um, people take advantage of that when they want to cap their costs you know if you don't do that and you kind of roll the dice and and pay as you go 
Um, you might get pregnant on the first try and you might not. So some people like the idea of having a capped cost and you don't have to worry so much about coming up with additional funds um, if needed. There's another option of you know using a gestational surrogate as and um, using your own eggs. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> your own eggs, period. Um, so if you just need a surrogate and you have you have preserved your eggs or you're able to do a retrieval and get eggs and create embryos um, and just need the use of a surrogate, that's another program we offer. As well as those who need might need a donor and a surrogate like myself. Um, we also have our own egg donor agency, which is pretty wonderful. Um, so on our website, you can access, you can just look at profiles. If you just were curious to know what an egg donor profile looked like, you can just go online, log in, and just check one out and just see what information is there. You get a lot of information. Um, what's unique about our egg donor agency, that we, um, everyone on our site is willing to be a known donor. So there's known donation versus anonymous egg donation. In anonymous egg donation, you get a profile. You have no identifying information. So you simply have, and not simply, I shouldn't say. It's, a, it's an extensive profile, but that's all that you have. With a known donor, you have the ability to tailor that relationship to be what you want it to be. For example, if you wanted to meet her before you decided to use her and you just want to get a feel for a person, you can do that. If you just want to exchange contact information in case there's, God forbid, in a medical emergency or something that comes up down the road, you can do that. If you decide that you plan to tell your child down the road, your child starts to ask questions and you want the ability to open that door and say, this is a woman that donated, you have the option of doing that. Um, so those are all the, the benefits that come with a known donor. With an anonymous donor, the door is shut at the profile. Um, some people choose, choose to go that route because it, it, does, it can make it simpler in some aspects in the, in the sense that you think you have less people involved. Um, but I do encourage people to not only think about the short term when you're making these decisions, but think about the long term and your child and, and what if they ask questions. And if you shut that door now, you don't have the ability, you might not have the ability to open it later. So that's part of our conversation that we talk to people about when they're considering what type of egg donor they want to use. But all the donors that are on Circle's listing are willing to, are educated about being a known donor and are willing to be known, which is pretty unique to find in an egg donor agency. That's not always the case. So let's talk a little bit about more about what a surrogacy journey looks like. So like I said before, you start with a consultation and it's just getting to know the process, getting to know our services so that we can better understand who you are and what your services are, what, what services you'll be needing from us. Um, then you are asked, you sign on, which you are asked to sign an agreement of service with the agency. Um, your funds are placed into two lump sum payments. The first is due at the very beginning to fuel your process. Um, and the second half is due before you go into the pregnancy IVF process. So after your funds are in place and you sign your contract with us, you're placed onto our matching list. And matching with your surrogate, it varies in time frame depending on what your needs are. Um, matching could be as quick as one to three months. Um, I think on the latter end, which is really more for international clients, if there are people who are listening to this that are not from the US, um, it might look more like six to eight months. Um, but it's a pretty fast process. So we take the time to get to know you, what you're looking for in a surrogate, um, combine that with what the surrogates that are being screened, um, what their qualifications are, and we encourage you to, we would present a profile to you. It's kind of like a little bit of a strange online dating feeling because your, surrogate, your potential surrogate will view your profile and you'll review hers. And if you feel good about each other and you want to meet her and get to know her, we help arrange what we call a match call. And typically they're done through Skype because like I said earlier, surrogates can be from all over the country. Um, so typically Skype is a, a very popular um, format to use to talk and get to know each other. Um, if both parties, both you and the surrogate come back and say, this feels right, I, I, I want to be, I want to work with this person, then you're considered a match. But if either party doesn't feel comfortable, it, it's not, um, it doesn't move forward because you both have to be willing. No one is forced to work with anyone that they don't feel comfortable with. Um, I want to take a little side step and say what, what goes into making a match? Because um, I think that there's several screening steps that the surrogates go through in order to get them to the point where they're going to be matched with our IPs. Um, just to give a little glossy overview of that. Um, it starts with an online questionnaire 
that actually rules out a good chunk of applicants. Um, the ones that are left, we ask, ask them to send their medical records, and we have a nurse practitioner who reviews them um, and makes sure that they truly have had healthy pregnancy histories, so there's no alarming um, health concerns. If she looks good to our medical staff, then she moves on to a clinical social worker screening um, who spends some time getting to know her and why does she want to be a surrogate, why does she think she'd be a good surrogate, um, how does she view herself connecting with you as the parents, how does she view her connection to the baby, just to get a feel for does she have the right perspective of this process and, and educate her about what's really involved. Um, she goes through a psychological screening with our psychologist. Um, they also do a criminal and a financial background check. So she can't have any history of criminality. Um, and the family has to be a self-sustaining family unit, whatever that is for them. They can't be um, on certain types of family assistance, public assistance. They need to be self-sustaining, even if they might not be a wealthy family per se. But it might they, they can't be dependent on this income. A lot of people, I feel like a lot of the misconceptions of surrogacy, <coughs> one a big one is, aren't they just doing it for the money? Um, and a surrogate typically gets paid between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars for a journey. And even though that's a wonderful amount of money, it's not a life-changing amount of money. It's not a million dollars that will dramatically impact her way of living. Um, so I, that is, that's part of our assessment is to make sure that that is not there's no there's not a need for this income. That's really what we're assessing. So then, how do you become a match? Um, we'll spend time talking to you about what you're looking for in a surrogate. How do you see yourself connecting with her? Um, one of the things that really sets the circle apart from other agencies, every agency kind of has their own mantra and philosophy, but ours is relationship-based. We want people to form connections with their surrogate if they use an egg donor with their egg donor. We want people to have those connections because we find that that lends itself to the healthiest process. Um, a lot of people come in and say, I just want to pay, and baby will come nine months later, and that be the end of it. And we don't work that way. That's not, um, we don't find that that's really good for anybody, not for the surrogate, not for you guys going through it. It's, um, so we find, so we really encourage people to connect. Um, so when you're considered for a match, we're looking at several things. Um, we're looking at, are you a good legal fit? Um, we talked earlier a little bit about how the laws vary from state to state, so we're going to make sure that legally it's a sound state and that um, it can meet your needs, what your needs are. Um, are you a good social fit? So different types of um, questions that come up in your application process, you know, what are your perspectives of abortion and selective reduction? Now, I know those are hard-hitting topics and um, take a lot of consideration, but we need to make sure that you and your carrier have a similar perspective on those types, different types of things. Um, if you had any real criteria for location. Sometimes people in New York will say to me, I really want a surrogate that lives on the Northeast. I really want her to live really close by. Um, and my reply will be, that's fine. You can certainly put whatever stipulations you want to put that will make you feel comfortable, you can. However, it will limit your pool and it will extend your match time. So when I say to you, match time could be one to three months. If you start to say, I only want a surrogate from Pennsylvania or I only want a surrogate from Connecticut, you can spend time waiting on that, and if you're if you're not in a rush and you would prefer that, you can certainly do that. But it's not um, the more open you are, the less criteria you have, the more open you are to location, um, the more more options you have, and the better we are at finding who that person is for you. So um, communication is a key part of this whole process. The better you are communicating with us, who, what your needs are, the better we be at finding that person. Um, so. And the last piece of matching is, is it a good emotional fit? And that's for you to determine if you feel comfortable with this person. So like I said before, you'll be presenting her profile and she'll look at yours and you'll have a match call. And if you both come back and say this feels right, then you're considered a match. And then you're moving into the, I'm trying to get pregnant IVF process. Um, so it's a lot of planning and work and trying to establish these connections. And once they're established, it's kind of amazing how just you snap your fingers and off you go. You're moving into the IVF piece and you're trying to get pregnant. Um, and then you're going, let me sidestep a second because I should say that, let me not forget the legal work. I always tend to forget and gloss over the legal work, but there's a period of contracts where you're creating contracts with your carrier. Um, simultaneously, she's going for medical screening. So even though we've reviewed her medical history and everything looks really wonderful, um, your IVF doctor is going to want to meet her in person and assess her and make sure she's ready to go into the IVF process. And then you're moving on and your surrogate is getting her body ready. She's doing injectables as well. If you're using an egg donor, 
they're getting their bodies ready simultaneously perhaps, um, which is what we call a fresh transfer, and off you go to try to achieve a pregnancy. Um, once a pregnancy is achieved, once a heartbeat is established, I should say, because we we don't consider a surrogate pregnant until a heartbeat is established, um, then you're into the months of pregnancy. And that is a truly remarkable place to get to, especially after all the things we've talked about already, to get to this point when you are expecting your child to be born is, is I know for me, I just felt like we finally got there where kind of, you know, you think about other people in your life who so easily can just go get pregnant and then you finally, all the things that you had to do, all that effort, and now finally you just sit, kind of not sit back because you're still, you know, you might still be worried and thinking about all the things that come with parenthood that's around the corner, but um, then you can kind of enjoy the months of pregnancy and, and getting to know your surrogate and connecting with her and getting ready to become a parent. And then we're helping you prepare for birth, um, prepare for the hospital stay, prepare for getting your baby home safely from wherever that might be. Um, so my surrogate is from Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, I remember having a lot of anxiety about what is that going to be like to travel home with a newborn. And um, in truth, it was completely fine. The anxiety was for a little reason. You can actually fly with a baby as young as two days old. Who knew? Um, two days old. Some, every airline has their own set of criteria. Some are two days, three days, four days. Um, I do remember a moment over my husband said to me, pretty close to the birth, um, maybe we should just drive home. Maybe we shouldn't fly, maybe we should drive home. And I'm like, something tells me driving across country with a newborn is probably far more risky than just <laughs> flying home. Um, and the flight was uneventful. He slept the entire time. He was completely, I had a blanket over him. I, I, we stared at him the entire time as if he was like a ticking time bomb and he was completely fine. Um, and then we were home and then here we are. All these things that we did and now we're parents and now I have to adapt to that whole. Um, and then you're just, you're starting from go like everybody else. You know, it's like, here we are, we're having all these conversations that so many other people are fortunate enough not to have. But then you all start at the same point where you're parents and you have your baby. And then who really cares how they came to be? It's just about them. Because I was, honestly, I talk about it so much, so it's constantly in my mind. But when I'm with my son, I don't think about all these steps that we're talking about. So it is, it kind of becomes on the back burner. Um, so those are the steps of of the surrogacy process. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have a financing program just to give you the information um, about our, our program that offers two different kinds, our standard and exceptional. Um, again, it's based on your credit score and the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. The, um, Interest varies, thank you. The interest varies, you can tell that I'm not the person who usually talks about the financing. Um, the interest varies based on your credit score and your credit history. But it's a wonderful option to be able to know that you have the opportunity to pay things off over time. So, we have this wonderful guidebook that we've created um, that is downloadable from our website. I could also email it to you if you want to email me. It's my contact information so you have it. Um, I'm always open to speaking more about these topics. I love talking about it. I love being able to give survivors information. So please don't hesitate to use me as a resource. Um, I'm always here. I'm actually going to be at CancerCon in Denver um, exhibiting for Circle Surrogacy. So for those of you who are part of the student cancer community and are going to be going, I'll be there answering questions. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to open this up to questions. I feel like I talk really fast. So um, let's see. Do we have any questions from our online listeners? We do. It says, I have some questions for the Q&A. OK, how do the prenatal appointments and delivery work with long distance? So let's talk about that. So prenatal appointments, what I encourage people to do is think about how involved they would like to be with appointments. You have the opportunity, if you have the means, you can go to every appointment. Um, our surrogates sign a HIPAA release so that you can have direct communication with her doctor, even though she is the patient, that's your baby, so you can talk to them directly. The um, 
it being present in person depends on where she lives and if you have the means to get there all the time. Um, if I had the means to go to Utah every month, I certainly would have, but I, that wasn't realistic. Um, what my surrogate did, which I absolutely adored her for, was even with the time difference, she scheduled her doctor's appointment so that I could be on the phone. She had me on speaker so that every time she heard my son's heartbeat, I was able to hear it. Every time I, the, I could hear in real time what the doctor had to say. And that made me feel more aware and more connected to the pregnancy. So, um, so it really is all about how involved you want to be. You can really make this process what you, how engage you. You have the option to go all the time or not go at all. I wouldn't say not go at all. You have to go to at least one in person that is in your contract that you will attend one visit in person, meet the doctor, talk to the doctor in person, um, take a tour of the hospital where she'll give birth. You know, get a feel for what you should be expecting come birth time so that you're not confused. I know for us, we wanted to do like almost like a little test run, like where's the airport in relation to the hospital and where's the nearest hotel and get the lay of the land a little bit so that when you're going for the birth, you have some familiarity. Question number one. Question number two is, do you, do you help if family or friends have offered to be a surrogate? Yes. What we typically do is we would encourage you to kind of go at it one of two ways. You can have your, if your family or friends are going to be a surrogate, you can have them go through the same surrogacy screening that we put all of our surrogates through to make sure that we they are still that we would give them the stamp of approval to be a good carrier. If you don't want to go through that process and you just want to do just have our legal services in place and do things kind of a la carte in that way, we can handle that in that aspect as well. I would encourage people though, and I think that is a beautiful thing to have a friend or family member offer to carry a child for you. Um, also complex, complex in the sense that, you know, it can blur boundaries, it can be, um, you know, I always said if I had a sister that I would, you know, have, I would have used her eggs or I would have, you know, maybe used her as a carrier. Um, I only have a brother, so he was <laughs> no use to me. Um, but I don't know that I definitely would. After I just think it can make things a little confusing. I guess it depends on the relationship you have with them. So you have to really be um, comfortable with the idea that this is the person that's going to carry your child, and how's that going to feel once your child's here, and when you tell them the story, and what's that going to feel like, and to think about all those things. So um, my best advice to that would be I, I would encourage your family or friend to still go through the process as if they were a stranger and just make sure that they are have kind of met all the criteria to be a, a good carrier. Um, and do you recommend using family or friends versus stranger if the opportunity exists? So I kind of talked about that a little bit already. I, I, I think it's a beautiful thing if you have, I would explore it, I would really think about it and I would really take the time to process, not like you said, not only the um, during the pregnancy what that's gonna feel like, but after your child's here, how's that gonna feel? Knowing that this person that's in your life every day or you know the family member especially is was the person who gave birth to them how's that going to feel if you're comfortable with that i wish you the best um because that's a beautiful thing to have that opportunity what else oh so we have questions i okay. sorry <laughs> um i've heard surrogacy alone not including egg donation is a hundred thousand dollars is this accurate so um, what I can speak to is circles services and circles charges. So it's not quite $100,000 if you just need a surrogate. It's about 80 to 85. Um, and that includes all the legal work, all the social supports that are in place, the screening of the surrogate, um, the supports that are in place throughout the process, the legal work pre birth and post birth um, for the birth certificate, you know, preparing for the birth certificate. There's a lot of legal work that goes on. So that kind of covers all of that. Um, if you're adding a donation into the equation, then the cost goes up clearly. Um, and then you're looking at, I give a window because it's not, a, there's no, there's no, never a fixed rate because it varies on so many different factors. Um, but I would say somewhere between 125 to upwards of 150, depending on so many factors. If you need multiple rounds of IVF, if you um, need to buy an insurance, a specific insurance policy, there's so many variations in what the cost can be. So we give ranges. Um, and I know, it, like I said before, it's not cheap whenever you're referring to any kind of reproductive, any third party reproduction, unfortunately, is just not something that comes cheap. Um, so I hope that answers your question. What's next? 
says, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I appreciate the information. How did bonding go when you got home? Um, I love that question because I was really anxious about it. I was really worried that, you know, all this bonding goes on in the womb and, and, I, and I, I don't want to undermine that by any means, but I was worried. I was worried that he wouldn't be familiar with my voice or um, I, that I wouldn't feel connected after not having carried him. Um, but I didn't feel that way at all. I did not feel that way at all. The moment he was born, the moment I saw him, um, there was an instant connection. You have to, you know, you're, you're so in, also, every step of the pregnancy, you're so involved, you know, from like little, little, little silly things, like the app on my phone that tells me how big my baby is. Like, okay, he wasn't inside of me, but I still know how big he was. You know, like there are so, so many little things that you can still feel connected. Um, again, like I said, I was on the phone for every doctor's appointment. Um, our surrogate was amazing and talking to her. We talked, we Skyped every single week, even though she was in Utah. And I got to see her every single week. As her belly grew, I got to see her um, and, and it made me feel connected. So I didn't have a difficulty bonding or connecting. And I don't think he did either. <laughs> Can't ask him, but um, I don't think he did either. I think that we very quickly adapted to being parents and him connecting with us. That's a good question, though. I think that um, some people are, you know, fear that and don't bring it up. And I'm glad that you did. Um, when selecting a surrogate slash donor, are there ever are they ever the same person, or do you typically have a separate egg donor and surrogate? Also, a really good question. So years ago, when surrogacy first was uh, first started. It, there were two different types of surrogacy called one traditional surrogacy and, and then gestational surrogacy. So traditional surrogacy is when the egg donor and surrogate are one and the same. Um, that type of surrogacy is not done anymore because there are more um, challenges legally. So we don't do traditional surrogacy. If there happened to be a situation maybe where it was a family member and I'm still, I still don't even know if we would do it, honestly, because I think it just it blurs the boundaries so much more so. I think when your surrogate is not genetically connected to the baby, I think it helps it helps the surrogate feel a certain separation that's a healthy one, um, that if she knows that it's not her child, that she's the egg donor as well, then it is genetically her child. And that, that can lend itself to a whole lot of other um, sets of emotional challenges for everybody. So no, we don't do traditional surrogacy. So is that the end of our questions for now? That is the end of our questions. Those are really good questions. Thank you for asking some questions. I'm I'm so glad to get some feedback from people that are listening. It's very this is very strange for me, this whole Google Hangout thing of there are people out there listening. It's nice to know that you're there. <laughs> um, how about people in the room? Any questions from you guys? That's the good spot. <laughs> you can chime in at any point. No? So um, as I said before, this is not a one-time opportunity to get some information. I'm always available. Um, I really love talking to other survivors and hearing their stories and such truly amazing stories of what people have been through. And I'm happy to lend myself as a resource to get more information about family building options. And I love being able to talk about how I became a mom. It's pretty amazing. So thank you. Thank you, Steve Kenter, for hosting us. and letting us be here. Thank you, Mallory, for your help, my tech assistant. <laughs> yes, we are very happy to have you guys here and share not just the service there with you, but stupid kids are as well, so. Yes, so thank you. And um, again, any other questions? Um, can I go back to my information? Yes. So I can put that back up so people, if they haven't had a chance to write it down, they can. Um, excellent. So there you have my information. Um, feel free to reach out at any point. I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you for being here and joining us and um, talk to you guys soon. <laughs>